Have a good day, and I'm glad uh, I can share uh, the kind of uh, pastoral training that uh, my radical seminary is doing. And maybe for uh, those of you who have yet to know me, let me just say that I'm the president uh, of the Asian School of Development and Cross Cultural Studies, for short, ASDEX. And so, uh, Asian School of development and cross-cultural studies. Development means you become an expert in working with the poor to transform the community. Huh? A barangay or a town or a city or even a province. Uh, it is how do you bring development uh, into the, the community. And this, and there in as DEX, D is, uh, D -E is the development, C is cross-cultural, meaning uh, that uh, doing this cross-culturally, uh, meaning uh, you can do this in a communist, uh, Buddhist, or uh, Muslim context uh, with cultural sensitivity and effectivity. And so, uh, that's to situate that every pastor is able to transform their community as well as situate that members of his congregation will be able to go overseas, uh, fulfill the Philippine Missions Mobilization vision to have one million Filipinos as OFWs, uh, overseas Filipino workers, uh, effectively transforming communities in Buddhist, communist, uh, and uh, Muslim, uh, Hindu areas, wherever they go. And uh, my expertise uh, grew mainly in mobilizing people for China, uh, communist uh, territory. They go in really as English teachers. I'm glad they may go in now as uh, in, in some, uh, in one innovative theological seminary, they can go in as, you know, waiters or as, uh, hotel, front desk, uh, uh, managers, uh, as they have HRM as their uh, cover. But anyway, uh, that's uh, what my, my school does uh, to train uh, the two huge gaps in traditional seminaries. In other words, uh, most of our seminaries uh, train the pastor just to keep their flock happy and then how to let the members uh, become a big happy family, but hardly any uh, impact in the community, uh, failing to become salt and light uh, so that through their good works, uh, God is glorified in the community. And so then the other one is uh, they also don't have the missionary vision to see to it that their members can go to another city or to go to another country uh, to make an impact for Jesus. And so that's the kind of, uh, perhaps I would say, the uh, radicalness of um, the, my seminary. And notice that although we offer masters and PhD, they are not theological or seminary degrees. Uh, pastors and missionaries who graduate from our master's program, uh, their credential is called Masters in Transformational Leadership. We, uh, for young people who are training to become pastors, we, we would offer Masters in Community Development or Masters in uh, Development Management, how to uh, start a foundation or an NGO from your church so that it can transform the entire community, uh, starting maybe with a feeding program or with a, a medical mission or a, uh, in the Philippines, an educational program uh, with the Department of Education uh, so that uh, you can help uh, graduate high schoolers uh, from, so that no Filipino 
will pass the age of 30 without a high school diploma. <laughs> so that's the kind of uh, involvement that a local church should have in order to transform uh, their barangay or, or their province if, if they are trained in our master's program. For those who are, will get our PhD, uh, they don't even need to come to our school. Uh, they can get it uh, by tutorial. Uh, we assign a, a thesis advisor uh, in uh, eight courses, uh, paying about uh, for uh, 10, uh, equivalent of 10 courses for about uh, 4,000 US dollars. Uh, they can uh, get a PhD uh, from us to become an expert either in international development or in Asian studies, meaning uh, they know a culture that they want to serve in, uh, a Buddhist culture or a Muslim culture, and something that they can go to UP to get a master's in uh, Islamics or, or in Buddhism. Uh, well, uh, hopefully they can get it from, from our school. Uh, ask next. And so, uh, that, I think, more or less summarizes uh, an overview of where uh, I'm taking us this morning uh, that uh, 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 about what I'll introduce to you. So what is necessary to train Filipino pastors to become world changers who can fulfill Acts 1.8 that powered by the Holy Spirit, they can... Uh, produce witnesses for Jesus, not just in their Jerusalem, but also in their Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, whichever place uh, God will call the members of his congregation uh, to go. And hopefully some of them, uh, 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 like in some Abkop churches, like in Diliman Bible Church, everyone who becomes a pastor there before had to go out and become a missionary. Uh, Demi here became a missionary, uh, Jean Lara, they all became missionaries to the Muslims. So, because if you are a pastor and you are given a shorter mission trip by your church to go and visit the Muslim area, most probably once you are touched, your pastoral heart will say, I cannot just shepherd 99 sheep, I have to go and look for the one lost sheep. And <laughs> in the Philippine context, we are already over Christianized in this country. And you need to start thinking what happens to the Muslims? What happens to the Muslims, not just in the Philippines, in Mindanao, but also the Muslims in Baguio, in Quiapo, and of course, most probably uh, in Bahrain and in uh, Malaysia and Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan. So that's the kind of uh, sending that happens, uh, mainly because uh, well, I sincerely believe that the Philippines should be the number one Asian missionary sending country in Asia. Why? We have the longest history of Christianity and we are the only Christian nation in Asia. So we really have to uh, uh, do our part uh, to really finish the Great Commission uh, with our Asian partners, of course and as well as our global uh, partners, <laughs> GP, uh, in order to e evangelize uh, the whole of Asia. Not just uh, effectively, but also strategically so that all the Asian countries will become Christian nations within the next 10 years. So uh, given that uh, as our goal, uh, uh, I think it's achievable. Uh, mainly because uh, Jesus said, I will build my church and no gates of hell will prevail against it. No satanic force, no demonic uh, forces in the folk Islam or folk uh, Buddhist uh, context are going to stop the advance of God's kingdom uh, in, in Asia, uh, the, now the least uh, evangelized continent uh, in the world. And so uh, we're only about 3% go to church on Sundays. And so we have a big problem to situate that 97% of Asia uh, really gets reached uh, in the fastest way possible because hell is now full of Asians. And, and we've got to stop the flood of Asians going to hell and get heaven full of Asians. 
Uh, okay. And so uh, with that kind of sense of urgency, I had that already since 50 years ago. Now, <laughs> you have to look at me as a 64-year-old okay, uh, veteran. Are you? Are you? I am 64 years old wow. as of last month. And, and so uh, I, I, and I'm a fifth-generation Christian. Uh, my great-grandfather from China was the first convert of the uh, Reformed Christian, uh, Christian Reformed missionaries uh, from uh, the U.S. Of course, they're partners with the British, uh, the, from the Scottish and Irish Presbyterians, uh, who came to southern China in Shaman, and, and there my, my great-grandfather was the first convert there. And he started a good family tradition that whoever is the firstborn in his clan, uh, in his family, would be offered for full-time Christian service. Uh, so I'm the eldest of the eldest of the eldest <laughs> of, of, of that uh, family. And I grew up with a father who sees to it that every week we have two nights of family devotion. Tuesday night and Friday night we do the worship together at our home as a family you know so that kind of of, of tradition uh is what i carry on uh, but it is not a multiplying one except that my father had another experience he belonged to the jan sung revival you know the bigger the most brilliant uh chinese who turned chinese christianity upside down was dr jan sung uh, if you know his story he died at the age of 45, uh, but he burned his life for the evangelization of China. And uh, he went to New York. Uh, he was a pastor's kid, a Methodist, so was sent to America to study. Uh, and he finished a PhD in chemistry. Mm. But to make the long story short, uh, upon crossing the Pacific Ocean back to China, he threw the diploma. Uh, all his other diplomas, except this PhD in chemistry, back to his father. You know. But in the meantime, uh, he uh, went to get a theological degree, and for two years, he was put in a, in a mental asylum. He became evangelical, born again, and was so fervent in sharing Jesus uh, to his classmates, even in the seminary, that the school thought uh, he was mentally... Uh, yeah, problematic. He was put in, and there he read the Bible more than twenty times. Okay, that was his seminary, the real seminary. Uh, although he finished uh, with a master's also from from there, and, but uh, when he came back to China, he show, said all of these are rubbish, <laughs> almost like Paul. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've been trained as a Pharisee. I now throw away all my credentials for the sake of identifying with the suffering, having the fellowship with the suffering of Jesus, uh, Philippians chapter 3. And in there, uh, my father got con uh, contaminated by this zeal mm. and, uh, of this uh, Jan Sung. And wherever he went, the revival came to the churches in China, preparing China for not just the Second World War, but also for the communist takeover. He would, in his revivals, there will be healings, there would be uh, all kinds of uh, dramatic things. Uh, he preached uh, very unusually, uh, I would call radical. He dressed in Chinese gown and uh, he would uh, use drama, uh, uh, throwing uh, pots and uh, showing uh, the importance of repentance from sin. And when people repented, they would be all be baptized. And then, uh, most important, he would group his converts two by two or three to become evangelistic bands. Even if they are just teenagers, uh, age 16, 17, 18. That's, my father was just 16. When he joined this band, uh, two or three of them would go to another village uh, just to go and spread uh, whatever they have learned about Jesus, you know. So, so that prepared, I think, China for the communist takeover when God closed down all the church buildings. 
he sent all the pastors to prison. He sent out all the missionaries out of China. And he closed down all the Bible schools, okay, through the help of Mao Zedong. And so China became brand new in the sense that Christianity now, out of its Western dress, became truly Chinese, carried by ordinary Chinese farmers and Chinese uh, urban dwellers like barbers or, uh, in, in the case of my uh, family, uh, my grandfather was an owner of a funeral parlor, uh, a very good place to evangelize, you know, everybody who is grieving and, and uh, the family surely can be uh, introduced to Jesus as they uh, uh, find hope uh, in, in death. Now anyway, uh, that's the kind of uh, simple Christianity that my father brought from China to the Philippines when he came as a, I call, tent maker to teach uh, biology in a Christian high school, Hope Christian High School now, uh, in uh, Binondo. And he went to Zamboanga, and later on settled in Bacolod. And in Bacolod, I now enjoy. And my father became the elder of this Trinity, uh, yeah, Bacolod Trinity Christian Church. And I saw from my childhood how every year he would bring one, two, or sometimes three families to Jesus to be baptized as families. It could be done. <laughs> that an a ordinary office uh, accountant who became an, a, a manager of, of, of a company uh, could be leading people to Christ uh, by families. Uh, and so I would say 70% of the converts who came to Jesus and became baptized members of our local church were all led to Christ by my father. You know. So that's the kind of, uh, I say, uh, pastoral challenge that I had when at the age of 16, I already offered myself to go to China. Now, the, uh, before that, I was already called a little pastor by my uh, uh, people in the church. Uh, because I would always stop the Bible quiz, you know, I am a walking Bible encyclopedia. Everything uh, or, uh, they have to ask about Bible, uh, I, I would know. I am the favorite of all Sunday school teachers. And of course, started teaching Sunday school at the age of 12. So that's the kind of, uh, uh, let's say, background by which God equipped me that by the age of 16, I, I, and, and my, by the way, my a uh, hero of faith during my childhood was David Livingstone, okay, and Albert Schweitzer, you know, uh, uh, because my father gave me the book, uh, The 50 Great Lives uh, of, of uh, Reader's Digest, uh, you know, the, the, the special edition. And there I, I was already thinking, wow, Jan Soong? Uh, I also read his biography already. I read the biography of Sadhu Sundar Singh already. So that's a kind of uh, uh, education <laughs> and training that I had as a child uh, growing up uh, in, in a small town, a uh, city in, in the Philippines. Anyway, uh, upon my, uh, that's third year high school, just uh, before finishing high school, uh, I was already asking God, Lord, give me China or I die. You know, I got to go back uh, during a youth conference. Uh, the challenge was, you who are Chinese, who know a Chinese language. And of course, I grew up with Fukinese, uh, Fujianese, and went to school and learned Mandarin. So I have two Chinese languages in my system. And so uh, I said, I've got to go back and really won, uh, win the, uh, uh, effectively huh, the, uh, all the uh, China uh, residents and citizens uh, for Jesus. Now, of course, along the way, uh, just before I finished college, uh, I finished AB in psychology, magna uh, cum laude, because uh, I, I was really good in, uh, in school. But more important, I, I think I was summa cum laude in multiplying disciples for Jesus. 
in the school campus, you know, IVCF. Through InterVarsity, I learned how to become an expert expositor. Okay? If I can preach, I can keep people uh, awake for two hours with good uh, exposition of the Bible. And at the same time, the most important, how to multiply cell groups. That's why now I am an expert in multiplying house churches and uh, seeing to it that every house church can change their village or their community. That is where uh, the uh, kind of uh, in heritage I have as I started to practice how to evangelize a school campus. After I graduated uh, from the Sal uh, Bacolod, uh, the uh, five years after my graduation, the Light and Soul Christian Fellowship, LS La Sal Light and Soul Christian Fellowship that I started with just a prayer partnership with one weak Christian, uh, former Mormon, <laughs> we started praying together. Within four years, we had eight cell groups, and we by the time. Uh, uh, five years later, without any more contact after my graduation, Life and Soul Christian Fellowship could hold concerts in the gymnasium of La Salle. And they were chosen to be the top, one of the top three student organizations in La Salle. In other words, the disciples that I had were discipling others who, be, who uh, after graduation, were passed on to their disciples how to impact and multiply disciples in La Salle. So that's the kind of uh, orientation that I have. And um, by the time I went to ATS to get my Masters of Divinity and to Korea uh, in Acts, Asia uh, Yonhap Singakwon with uh, Dr. Han Sulha, uh, I uh, came back with Masters in Theology, major in the New Testament, uh, Uh, with my mentor, uh, thesis uh, advisor, uh, Kim oh, Se-yoon. Yeah. Okay. And that's the kind of heritage also that I got, uh, where I wrote my dissertation, on, uh, my thesis on the New Testament concept of the Ecclesia and its implications for the churches in the Philippines. Uh, and then, uh, there, I became a professor at ATS, became the director for extension programs, having a TEE uh, for ATS, and then uh, uh, the director for student uh, affairs, uh, helping the students uh, in their spiritual life, uh, almost like a chaplain. And then, I said I was overeducated for Asia, but then two faculty members, Americans, told me, David, you have got to go to America, get a PhD, so that you can speak to white people eye to eye. Because you have a PhD, like that, more than that. And so uh, I went to Fuller, got my PhD in New Testament, and, therefore, and then uh, wrote on the servant nature of the church in the Pauline epistles, uh, just to master the ecclesiology of the Apostle Paul. And then came back, uh, now uh, with the fire saying that at ATS, I'm going to make ATS the most important seminary in Asia to model the kind of graduates that can transform communities and can do it cross-culturally. Well, within, uh, within one year, I became the academic dean of ATS. That was 1988. And since I'm a servant dean, I said I'm going to serve only for three years. After that, somebody else must take over. I have to do something else. Well, anyway, uh, by 1991, uh, during those years, I was teaching only one course where every graduate of ATS must take. It is called Transformation Theology. It is a reaction or perhaps an improvement of evangelicals to liberation theology of the... Uh, uh, more liberal, okay, or, or the more ecumenical camp. Uh, liberation theology means you go with the poor, you fight for the poor, you struggle with the poor. But the evangelicals uh, are very afraid of that and don't know how, what to do with, with the community or what to do with the poor. 
And so ATS package this major course, three units of transformation theology. And I taught it, I enjoyed it, uh, combining uh, the course that I was teaching before I went for my PhD. It was church and culture. How can the church influence culture and society? So I was teaching that already. So uh, transformation theology now is a good packaging, <laughs> a good title for a course that really says, how do you develop and transform a communities? And, and, and there, uh, I think a every ATS graduate cannot forget me <laughs> because of, of uh, that course. But anyway, uh, the, by 1991, I was offered to go to OCMS, Oxford Center for Mission Studies. And so I dropped ATS and went to Oxford for two years. Uh, usually and one year. Usually, two years. yeah, I stayed two years. Normally, uh, it's uh, two years, two years. Uh, after that, uh, the first Asian uh, to be resident there, and then, uh, yeah, it was uh, a special faculty grant uh, to get uh, Asians to go to a, we call it a third world seminary in the first world. Okay, we are a bunch of radicals. Okay, uh, if you want to know their names, uh, these are uh, the British is Chris Sogden, okay, and uh, the uh, and uh, Asians are Dine Samuel, uh, and uh, in the Philippines, Melba Magali, <laughs> okay, uh, and uh, Bel Magali, Isabella Magali, uh, uh, and Vlad Pleciano, and Yeah, he, he has always been the, our godfather. If you talk about, uh, he is the expert fundraiser of uh, this bunch of what we would call uh, radical evangelicals. And we have an, a fellowship called Intimate, International Fellowship of Evangelical Mission Theologians. That was our former name. Now the new name for the younger generation is International Fellowship of mission as transformation <laughs> and, and uh, I hope uh, some of you can uh, and I'm glad one is now getting this, a PhD now uh, from OCMS at that time of course uh, most of the students are from the more Anglican or Methodist uh, tradition uh, from Africa and India so I was there guiding them how to get their uh, PhDs from the British system anyway uh, I enjoyed it but more important is I came back to Asia and said, no, I've got to go full-time as a missions mobilizer.